Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glad you could be with us this morning. Glad you made it out on this cold, wet day. I want to say a special welcome to all who are joining us by Facebook Live. and uh, Draw your attention to all of the announcements that are in the bulletin. Uh, hope that you take note of all the things that are there. Uh, Joe Hudson has a brief announcement regarding our involvement with Habitat for Humanity. Good morning. Centenary, along with several other churches in the area, is partnering with Habitat Humanity to build homes for needy folks in our area. Now, there may be a couple of retirees in the audience today, so you're the crowd I'm looking at. <laughs> so we do need volunteers from the congregation. Ladies, don't get relaxed, you're included in this also. And also, we'd like to invite teens 16 years and older who might be working on Saturday mornings. I might point out that Lynn Janetti has worked with us for many, many hours in the past, P.D. Scott also from this particular class. Now, there are a lot of tasks to be accomplished to go home. You only need to do what you're comfortable with. I have been threatened by the army if I'm caught on the ladder or up on scaffolding, so you won't see me up there, so just do what you feel comfortable doing. We have all the safety gear you're going to need. We have all the tools you need. Now the schedule, currently we're working two shifts, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. One shift on Saturday morning. Now the good news is, you decide when you want to work and how often. And you will schedule yourselves online. That's a neat part of that. <laughs> now, in the bulletin, I got a little short blurb with my name, Joe Hudson, and my telephone number. Give me a call. We'll set you up, I'll answer your questions. If you want, I'll take you out to the current site and show you around. So do that. Telephone numbers there. Let me leave you one thought. In the future, you will be able to point, your, point out one of these homes and say, I helped build this home for a needy family. It'll be with you for the rest of your lives. It's a good thing to do. I expect your calls. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I do want to share two things regarding Habitat for Humanity. First, I want to make sure that I remind you that Habitat, well, it's supposed to be turned on, there you go. Habitat does not actually give away houses. The persons who are in need contribute to the construction of the house, and at the end of the project, they buy the house. It is an opportunity for persons in need to be empowered uh, as they move into a new way of life. Secondly, allow me to share with you, I think the batteries are dead and I'll get some during the prayer. Secondly, allow me to share with you that as a part of our capital campaign and our mission tie, Centenary will be the title sponsor for one of, the, one of the houses built here in New Bern in the coming year. As we celebrate our 250th uh, year together, we are continuing to reach beyond ourselves and to be about the work of Jesus Christ in our midst. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
here in our reading, reading responsibly from Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great eagle. O Lord, humans and animals you save. O God, how precious is your steadfast love. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They may be unto others and their eyes, and you give them drink from the river of their lives. For with you is the fountain of life, in your light do we see light. O continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your salvation to the upright of the heart. Our hymn is number 103. Let us sing together, Immortal, Invisible, God Only What. Shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory. 
and you shall be called by a new name, that the month of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no, no, you shall no more be turned forsaken, and your land shall no more be turned desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall you build and marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall, so shall your God rejoice over you. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Spiritual gifts. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols and could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, <coughs> let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allows to each one individually, just as the Spirit of Jesus. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John, the second chapter. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to them, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants uh, who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Be God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all disciples 
all desires are known. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Some years ago, I was uh, traveling home from a workshop someplace or another and uh, was sitting in an airport lounge uh, working on the sermon for the coming Sunday. As I sat in the airport uh, in Dallas waiting to board my flight, I I was reading through various materials uh, preparing myself uh, for the sermon. In the background, there was a television set that was on. It was filling the room with sounds. I I wasn't listening to it. It was just kind of there. It was CNN. They were running a story about a reboot of the old Ark Linkletter show, Kids Say the Darndest Things. I continued to focus on my reading that I was doing, working hard on the... Uh, preparing for the coming Sunday. Uh, All of a sudden, I heard Art Linkletter ask, what is your favorite Bible story? Well, that kind of perked my interest. And so I began to listen just a little bit. The response came, when Jesus turned the water into wine. Well, that was the reading for that particular Sunday, and so I turned completely to see what was going to to be said next. Linkletter looked at a young African-American girl, eight or ten years old, and said, yes, that is a wonderful, wonderful story. What does it teach us? The girl thought for a brief moment, and finally she looked up and said, When your party runs out of wine, get down on your knees and pray. (laughs) Well, there you go. That was it. But I have to say, while Jesus was at a wedding feast, a party to be sure, and they did run out of wine, and there likely was some prayer involved, though I will point out, John never records any instance of Jesus praying or actually saying anything that turned the water into wine. Still, I'm not quite sure that that's the purpose of the story. Don't get me wrong, if the water in my, in my water bottle suddenly turned into wine, I would be impressed. I would take note. But I'm not real sure that I would say it was evidence of the glory of God being revealed. John says of this wonderful story that it was the first sign that Jesus performed and revealed his glory and that his disciples believed in him. This is the reason that the disciples believed in him? I mean, sure, it's worth remembering. There's no evidence that the first century uh, Jews had any indication that a symbol of water turning into wine was evidence that the Messiah was in their midst. There's no sense that the sign of the Messiah was to be a party. And yet there it is. This was the first sign that revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. You know, there's an interesting little encounter between Jesus and Mary. Though interestingly enough, John never uses the name Mary. He only ever calls her the mother of Jesus. It seems uh, that here they were at this wedding feast. It's somewhat unclear why Mary felt 
responsible uh, for this party running out of wine. Some commentators have suggested that it was in point of fact her own second marriage. Some commentators have suggested that Joseph died when Jesus was young and Mary remarried. Some commentators have suggested uh, that the disciples were not on the original guest list, that Jesus just brought them along. Maybe you've had that experience sometime. You would plan for a rather small gathering of just your friends. You had the right amount of food. You had all of the things planned. And suddenly one of your friends is standing at the front door and says, I hope you don't mind, but I brought my friends along. I thought they would enjoy it. And you look up and you say, oh, absolutely, how wonderful, so glad that they are here. All the while trying to figure out exactly how do I make food for six extend to 12. It could be that uh, what was happening in this moment is a reminder that the glory of God extends always to those who are not already invited. That the glory of God always has room for one more. Truth be told, uh, that would be a reason enough for us to hold on to this story for two millennia. But I want to point us in a slightly different direction. Somehow or other, Mary believed that Jesus cared that they were out of wine. And somehow or other, Mary believed that Jesus was able to do something about it. So she says to the servants, do whatever he asks. Their jars filled with water. They turn into wine. And the wine is taken to the steward of the party. Where he becomes confused about where did this wine come from. Now the steward of the party was likely hired for just that occasion, not actually a part of the staff, not actually a part of the family, just brought on to oversee that particular occasion. He had assumed that the bridegroom was holding back a little bit of wine that he had always had on hand, that he had always planned to hold for a better occasion, for a more important moment. I find myself thinking about all of the ways that we hold back rather than giving in to the working of God. All the ways that we hold in reserve, not wanting to give everything. The way we protect ourselves against some future need, some uh, opportunity yet to be. I think about uh, held back affection, stored up affirmations, and yes, wealth held back rather than meeting the need of the moment. Don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that we be foolish. We need to plan uh, for challenges. As my father would say, I always keep a spare tire in the back of my car, but sometimes. We let our fears about what might be keep us from meeting the need of the moment. We see a world in need. We believe in one who has claimed to bring abundance into the world. And we wonder why there are such needs. In a world where so many have no clean water, how do we read a story about water that becomes wine? How do we understand this miracle? What are we to do with it? We desperately want to tug onto the, to the sleeve of Jesus and say, they have no... And we want to believe that God will 
reach out. Commentators frequently point to the extravagance of this miracle. 60 gallons of wine. Late in the celebration. Something about this story points to the idea that God wants all to experience abundance. And we who gather in places like this hear the world say to us time and again, they have no food, they have no water, and we need to hear it. Something about our faith demands uh, that we care about people who are in need. Something about this Savior that we follow invites us to give everything to meet the need of this moment. To be fully present uh, for those who are in pain and to care deeply for their lack. Have you seen the story about the man reaching into the bottom drawer of his wife's dresser? He carefully pulls out a tissue-wrapped package. Opening it gently, he says, This is not a slip. This is lingerie. He discards the tissue and hands the lingerie to his sister. It's exquisite, handmade, trimmed with a cobweb of lace. The price tag, an astronomical figure, was still attached. The man's wife had bought it on their first trip to New York some nine or ten years earlier. She never wore it. She was saving it for a special occasion. This is that occasion. Lingerie was taken to the funeral director that afternoon. Don't ever save anything for a special occasion, said the man. Every day you are alive is a special occasion. My brothers and sisters, I don't know where you might be holding back, protecting uh, against some future need. Maybe it's a word of affirmation you haven't spoken to a loved one. Maybe it's an embrace that you have not given. Maybe it is a gift to the hungry, to the poor. Here's what I do know. You and I are God's plan for the universe. We are the ones. And we are invited to give absolutely everything that the glory of God might be revealed. That our world might believe in Jesus Christ. And that life itself might find abundance. Amen? Our hymn is number 354. Let us stand and sing together, I Surrender All.